So, as you know, this is our last roundtable event. Now, we are going to do a sort of group-wide wrap-up after this roundtable, so don't feel like this is the last chance to ask a question or voice an opinion, et cetera. Um, so, the last panel is another science, art, and society panel. Our first panel on this topic, we talked about um, how to overcome elitism in the arts and sciences and better connect with the people. You know, the, the people are who in, um, you know, look at art and engage with science, and it's important that we repair this kind of broken relationship between science and art, science and society, and art and society. We also talked about um, literacy or lack thereof, in uh, for the arts and for the sciences. And so, you know, there might be some panelists who want to continue that conversation because I don't think we quite finished it. Um, and we also talked about, you know, how to maintain the integrity of art and science while trying to connect with people who might have different ideas about what we should be studying or what we should be making work about. Um, so anyways, um, I am, I'm going to plant a, a seed question as soon as I sit down, but I will let Zach introduce our roundtable panelists. If each panelist could raise their hand as I announce their name. Suzanne Anker. Suzanne is a visual artist and theorist working at the intersection of art and the biological sciences. She works in a variety of mediums ranging from digital sculpture and installations to art, to large scale photography, to plants grown by LED lights. Her work has been shown both nationally and internationally in museums and galleries, including the ZKM, Karlruhe, Germany, Walker Art Center, the Smithsonian Institute, the Phillips Collection, PS1 Museum, and the JP Getty Museum, to name a few. Daniel Hill. Daniel is an abstract painter and sound artist whose work has been included in numerous exhibitions exploring the relationship between painting, sound, and science. Collections that hold Hill's paintings include United States Embassies, Microsoft Corporation, and the Bank of America. He is currently an adjunct associate professor of art at Pace University in Manhattan. Amelia Amen. Amelia is a solar designer with an aesthetic approach to integrating sustainable energy into the built environment. Her design company develops products and installations, including a solar awning with architects, solar signage for wayfinding, and dark sky compliant solar LED lights for Solar One Solutions, and many, many more interesting projects. Amelia is a member of the Collective for Community, Culture, and the Environment, CCCE, has served as chairman of the board of directors of the Northeast Sustainable Energy Association, and is co-founder of the New York chapter of O2 International Network for Environmentally Concerned Designers. Paul Brody. Paul is a psychiatrist and in an encounter couple centered couples guide and a storyteller. He co-founded Narrative Inc., a company that transforms individuals, teams, and organizations through the universal art of storytelling. He has led and participated in several projects with the Open Society Foundations, teaching storytelling as an advocacy tool to doctors and grantees from marginalized communities in Africa and Eastern Europe. He has taught in the Narrative Medicine Master's Program at Columbia University for the past seven years. Nancy Prinsenthal. Nancy is a Brooklyn-based writer whose book, Agnes Martin, Her Life and Art, received the 2016 Penn America Award for Biography. A former senior editor of Art in America, she has also contributed to Art Forum, The Village Voice, and New York, The New York Times. She has taught at the Center for Curatorial Studies, Bard College, Princeton University, and Yale University, and is currently on the faculty of the School of Visual Arts. Farzad Mahoudian. Farzad is a clinical associate professor at NYU's College of Arts and Sciences, Faculty of Liberal Studies. His interdisciplinary work focuses on the interactions of metaphor, myth, and science in the context of scientific theory, practice, and history. 
Recent publications include Metaphor and Chemistry, Jung and Laboratory Ethnographies, and Whitehead on Intuition, Implication for Science and Civilization. With that, I think Julia is going to start us out with a question. Okay, thank you, Zach. Um, so uh, over the last couple of days, we've been talking about a lot of things, and I, I'm, I'm going to mix some of our, our subject matters here. So I want to start by asking you all, since I think you'll all have a kind of informed opinion about this from one aspect or another, how can science art collaboration help repair the relationship the relationships that we're talking about between art, science, and society. So feel free to approach this question as you will, but with a focus on art and science working together to do this. <laughs> I'll start. Um, hi. Just want to actually have a look at each of the people that I'm talking to. Because <laughs> I woke up this morning thinking how strange it was to be going to have a conversation fairly personal conversation, because that's how it feels to me, with people I didn't know. Um, and so for me, I find myself in the last couple of days really not knowing whether I belong here. Like not sure why I'm here and whether I belong. I don't know if I'm a scientist, and I don't know if I'm really an artist. I don't. I, <laughs> and then I, thought, then I thought, well, maybe that's exactly why I belong. Because if, we can, if I can find a way of feeling that I belong, then we've done our job. And so for me, it's really about how we listen to one another. So most of the work that I'm involved in is, we, is looking at the space that exists between people and what occupies that space, and what shapes the space, and how we can unclutter the space. So when we look at art and science, the question is, what is the space, is there a space between them? And what can we do to take out whatever obstacles there are for them to coexist? So I, I realize people ask me, what do you do? What, what kind of psychiatrist are you? What, uh, what's your specialty? And I, I have a really hard time answering because I've all, I grew up in South Africa knowing that I wanted to be an actor. And so I went to medical school <laughs> and uh, finished medical school. And when a year out of medical school, gave that up and went to drama school in England and became an actor. And my life has been this endless back and forth between am I an artist, am I a, a guest scientist? Because I am a psychiatrist and I think one of the, the big struggles of psychiatry has been that it, it wants so badly to be a science. And I don't believe that it is. I mean, there are aspects to psychiatry which are science, you know, I do psychopharmacology, but even that is not a science. How you interact with the person so shapes whether the medications are going to work. So I just, I, 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 I start with that and I say that I, what I would love is if this conversation, rather than us talking about how we could create generative conversations out there, if we could create one right now, right here, that would be great. Say, and I think that there are a number of threads here we can pick up on about the antagonisms, really, between art and science. Uh, scientists like to think that if they are sort of engaged in art practice, it makes their science more humanistic. And for artists, if they are engaged in scientific ideas, it makes their intuitive kind of gestures um, more palpable to a general audience. But I don't think we're going to solve this problem here. This is an ongoing problem. And it's a problem that may even go back to epistemological issues about knowledge and its production and its measurement. Um, you know, in science, there's consensus. There's consensus based on mathematical <laughs> kind of rules. They may be bogus, but there is a methodology. There is the scientific method. 
Uh, there is no method in art, okay? Every method is an individual method. It's more or less a dialogue with art history and speaking to the dead. So, um, so I, I think the, the bigger arches here, um, not that they can't overlap somewhat, and they do, but trying to put them one on top of another is not in our interest. I mean, some people have talked about a third culture, and I think that's another bad idea. Um, well, so three people on top of each other, generally better than two. <laughs> Sometimes. Depends <laughs> who they are. <laughs> in the spirit of uh, generating conversation, yeah. contradiction's always a good place uh, to start. Absolutely. So as you contradicted uh, Paul, I'm going to contradict part of what you said. I didn't uh, feel like I, I contradicted I didn't Paul. I right. just sort of picked out some yeah. threads. Well, uh, <laughs> the scientific method thing, uh, part of yesterday's a uh, couple of the panels uh, some of the scientists said the scientific method there is no such thing I think one of them said it's crap uh, that was the old factory scientist but anyway whether it's crap or it's not there or it's looser than it is and I think you could probably find a few scientists I mean if, I keep confusing artists with scientists a few artists who would say that there's a lot of method in, in what they do uh, even if they change that method when they get to the next piece uh, having said all that, I'm going to contradict myself on top of that. Um, and <laughs> well, that's okay. I mean, yeah. in science, you aim towards repeatability. In art, yeah. if you repeat yourself, uh, if, if someone repeats yourself, then they're a, either a plagiarist or an appropriationist. Yeah. So the, the consensus in art is not based on repeatability. Is there a consensus in art? Yes, of course. <laughs> I'm going to have to jump in there and say I, I have never seen a and you know like like Paul um, I, I I feel um, pretty strongly like an imposter in this crowd um, and when I was hearing um, my um, short bio read I thought so what you know what's the skin I have in the game here um, I've been writing about art for about 30 years um, a part that I usually don't put in um, my biography is that I've been married to a neuroscience for those 30 years um, and more. <laughs> so I've been following very closely the relationship between the arts and the sciences, um, which has gotten a lot better. You know, 30 years ago there was very open hostility. Um, so I think one question that hasn't really been addressed that I'd like to um, introduce um, at some point is why, uh, you know, what historically, culturally, socially has led us to this point of greater um, intersection than we had 30 years ago when postmodernists were saying scientists were the enemy, they were searching for absolute truths, only postmodernists understood that no such thing was attainable. At the same time, so I'm going to go with like the spirit of contradiction, including self-contradiction. Um, I really firmly believe that what is most fruitful about the sciences and the arts talking to each other is understanding how important the boundaries between them are. This came up yesterday, I think Stuart Feinstein brought it up. Boundaries are crucial, I think, in our current political climate. Um, we really um, have reason to understand how ethically important the search for facts are, for alternate facts, I'm sorry, for facts that are not alternate, <laughs> that are not, you know, somebody's hope or somebody's, you know, political ambition. Um, so I think on, on, that, um, on that level, where artists and scientists are aimed is fundamentally different, I think. Artists are disruptors a couple of times um, over the course of this weekend. Um, artists have been enlisted in the role of clarifying, you know, of <laughs> making science understandable um, to everyone, um, which uh, brings us to the issue <laughs> of populism, which has also gotten a very complicated politically in the in, you know, in the past year. Um, and I think that, um, I guess the biggest difference between, the, or at least that's the way it seemed to me over the past few days, um, between how science and art operate is that um, art is fundamentally communicative. 
It's fundamentally about um, reaching from inside out, and scientists aren't, that's not a first order of business. Scientists are you know, interested in figuring things out. And so this idea, there, this idea has arisen that artists can then be kind of brought in to you know, take the figuring out and explain it. But the most interesting art I know that reflects ideas from um, science uses them in a kind of poaching way. You sort of, you know, kind of go into somebody else's territory, you take what you need, you're not explaining it. You're, you know, you're communicating something entirely else that can't be reduced to words. So I'll stop there. And in the spirit of contradiction, <laughs> I would say that one thing I've picked up from this conference is the similarities between art and science, that it, they're both sort of an, an investigation of the world as we know it, and so so little of what we do in school and in, in society is really talk about the real world, you know, the, the mm -hmm. physical world we live in. Um, and, and so uh, both art and science are largely self-directed. You know, people choose their, if not specialties, then, you know, whatever draws them, the, the big question that draws them, and then explore it, you know, usually in an iterative way, you know, so even if an artist isn't doing the scientific method, they're, they're working through things over and over to get to some, something that they're trying to say, whether it's inner or outer. Uh, so, I, you know, I think from that point of view, they're, they're sort of using different tools to get to some sort of reality or some sort of view of the world um, that, that is more in common than uh, a lot of other things that we Yeah, do. I, I, I think there's... Um basic epistemological differences. Um, and certainly as far as art being a pedagogical tool for science, I think it's something that's necessary in the world. I think somebody brought up yesterday, 48% of uh, the population in the United States does not believe in evolution. And there, is, there are people out there that believe the Earth is flat. So, uh, <laughs> you know, we need as much science and art as, as possible. Uh, a train of thought that came up with something, I think Nancy said. <clears throat> um, for me, in, in art school, I found uh, the conceptual underpinning that I wanted to have for my work did not fit in with the postmodern theory that was, was going on at the time. And I think this um, is a way that artists can uh, refer to something that is an objective truth. Mm -hmm. um, Postmodernism, uh, you couldn't talk, when I was in school, I couldn't talk about something being beautiful uh, and, and conceptual at the, at, the, at the same time. If it was beautiful, it could not also be uh, smart and have conceptual underpinning. And um, the conceptual art at the time, I didn't find visually interesting. I find science to be the ultimate conceptual adventure. And so I kind of had to quietly, secretly uh, build a methodology for making work uh, that science was um, the, the underpinning to what was going on. But it, it enables us now to talk about a truth that is true whether we believe it or not, and whether we know it or not. And I think that's really an important thing. So I have a question for you guys. We're talking about the differences between them and then the similarities. Um, let's jump on the similarities a bit, or, or at least the, the points of convergence where, uh, where there's a functional, meaningful relationship. And, and how do we address some of, these, some of these kind of societal things that we've been talking about, whether it's um, you know, maybe not as specific as how do we make people believe in evolution through an art-science partnership. But you know, this, is, this is the meat of what we're talking about here, is how can art and science band together to, to really do something, to, to bring us into the future that we envision for ourselves? Well, I think that is beyond the scope of essentially <laughs> Um, our thoughts here because, as I said earlier, this is an age-old kind of discussion. Um, the esteemed art historian Leo Steinberg wrote an article a number of years ago whether art and science should be linked together. 
and he brings up Leonardo, of course, who is the uh, master icon in this area, and he said, although Leonardo's scientific discoveries were very important at their time, that even without him, they would have been discovered. But his works of art had to do with the work of the man itself. And I thought that that was some of the most intelligent um, conversation about this subject. Now, what wasn't mentioned in my introduction is I'm chair of the Fine Arts Department at the School of Visual Arts. And in 2011, I built the first bioart laboratory in a fine arts department in America. And we have been on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. We've been on CUNY TV, et cetera. And the idea here is to use the tools of science to make art. And, the, and, and tools of art also include metaphor. They include irony. They include cultural critique, et cetera. And you're not going to do that in science. And, um, so I think, I think that the question of comfortability between disciplines is about territory. And there are many programs that, that invite artists, and in, particularly in Europe, to work with scientists. And sometimes they're accepted, and sometimes they're not. Well, we've reversed it. We have now invited scientists to work with artists. Mm -hmm. And it's the same kind of apprehension that these scientists feel about artists. It's that when they come into a bio art laboratory, they're stunned. Okay, It doesn't look like anything that they're familiar with, because it's a cross between the 19th century sciences, such as uh, of live animals, plants, et cetera, and molecular biology. So um, it's, been, it's been a subject now that is brewing in many other educational systems, uh, University of Dundee, University uh, of Albany, uh, Windsor University in Canada, et cetera. So this is a kind of growing phenomenon, and I think education is perhaps one of the key points of this convergence. And I, I think it's important to recognize um, that um, an essential element of the conversion is always going to be technology. And that, I agree. you know, it's, it's about agree. sharing tools yeah. uh, every uh, Medium in art is a technology. Painting is a technology. Right. Sculpture is a technology. You know, books were a technology yeah. that were cutting edge. At the, you know, at the time that they were introduced, um, and that it's at that level, I think. You know, rather than there's a, been a lot of talk about transdisciplinarity, which I think Suzanne, you and I both are suspicious of. Maybe um, <laughs> there's a lot of suspicion uh, around the table about whether or not there's this you know third way that yeah. actually um, is fruitful and, and constitutes a path forward. I think. You know, to bring the society piece into it, Julia, which um, maybe we're all a little bit suspicious of. Can we do that? Can we change the world? Um, at the same time, um, points to something that I think is more prevalent now than it perhaps once was, which is all of these things have ethical dimensions, right? Well, so um, it's something that I think scientists are thinking more about. I think artists are um, just assuming as part of the project in a way that maybe wasn't true 40 years ago or 50 years ago. Yeah, uh, especially when you consider we're experiencing exponential growth in technology. Whether or not we're going to have artificial intelligence um, in 50 or 100 years uh, is relevant. It, it's coming. and. Um, the moral and ethical implications for that are ambiguous. And because of this uh, advances in technology, it's also we live in an age where I think re religion is losing its relevance. And I think that arts, the arts can step up and, and be the moral conscience of our species. I, I think it's a duty, in fact. In what way? Critique. Um, 
We can build, uh, we can build a nuclear weapon. We could build um, artificial intelligence, but should we? And if we're going to build artificial intelligence, what, what kind? Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about this. Uh, I think some people have talked about it. That's going to have a huge implication on society, depending on what type of artificial intelligence we make. It could be a time of um, human um, uh, flowering of, of humanity, or uh, it could be something quite different. And how art is going to fit into that, I think. Art is, is in a bit of a state of crisis now. And if, if that's the case now, what will it be when uh, a, a human level artificial intelligence uh, can print out a, an artwork that will fool a human being uh, into thinking another human being made it, and, and beyond that, and find it interesting? Uh, and as well as uh, if 3D printing uh, is getting better and better and cheaper and cheaper, uh, we'll be able to print out uh, exact replicas of, of great master paintings or even living artists' paintings. Uh, they'll have huge implications on the gallery system. Uh, uh, perhaps galleries wouldn't be necessary in, in a situation like that. You could just print out a version of the painting and live with it for a while, and if you wanted to buy the real one, you could. It's sort of what happened with uh, the music industry, the streaming of music. Um, art was always different because it, uh, there was a reproducibility problem. Uh, but this, this would be a big change. That's but, you're right yeah. that it is um, not enough thought is being given, but there, is, uh, there are people who are starting to work on it. Max Tegmark has written a book on it. His new book, yeah. The, how to get ready for artificial intelligence when it actually becomes, goes to a point where it can in fact function better than we can. Which, yeah. which he says will happen very quickly, which is why we need to have the conversation now. I, I mean, it's been possible to fake paintings and you know, do reproductions of things for a long time. Uh, yes. Could, take you back a moment, could I ask if you, you're so interested in the boundary between art and science, why build a bio lab? Why build a bio lab? Why paint with acrylics when you had oils? Um, because it expands the artist's palette. <laughs> Simple enough. Yeah, I think there's um, the, the, there's so much going on here. Uh, I'll just I don't know where to start, so I'll just start with um, <laughs> with. Science, the products of science don't last, but those of art last. That's a fantastic distinction that is true and good uh, until we get to AI where you can reproduce it. That messes some things up and makes, it brings chaos in, in an interesting way. But, uh, but yeah, fundamentally, uh, the products of science shouldn't last. And the irony, could there be ironic science the way there is ironic art? That would be interesting um, to see. I think in the long run, historically, it is ironic because it does contradict itself. Well, there's also junk science. And there's junk science, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot of the stuff in a lot of the journals is just <laughs> yep. a way to pad things, and that's junk, and even if it's true. But there are things that... What's interesting about science uh, is that the... Um, its self-correcting nature is able to... Um, cast out what it thought was true and beautiful uh, and move on. And that's great and, and that's to its benefit and uh, we don't have to throw out Leonardo's artwork ever. And that's, that's a real clear distinction. I think it's important and absolutely true. Um, so what do we learn from, th how do we, what do we learn from that is uh, um, part of the question of the boundary, I think. There's a clear boundary on, on that point. So taking a scientific point of view on this, um, um, when you set up an experiment, you have to really make sure the boundary conditions are tight so that you know that the results you got are because of this. And if you diddle the boundary conditions, you get other results uh, from the same sort of experimental setup. Uh, and that kind of thing is basically improvisation. And uh, uh, Andrew Pickering writes about this, the mangle of practice. It's basically, you do one experiment, it's not coming out exactly, the results are not exactly what you thought. 
So you can diddle the boundary conditions or you can diddle your um, theory. Uh, but you keep basically messing around with both <laughs> until you're not breaking the instrument totally, but you're modifying it and you're stretching it to its limit. And you're not totally breaking the theory either. You might. You don't care. You, you can do that too. That sounds exactly like art. Methodically speaking, you're willing to take risks, uh, do improvisation. You don't know exactly where you're going. You're pleased with uh, you know, whatever might come out if it's useful to you, if it's fun. Uh, and in that way, they're, again, a lot alike. Uh, because of how they're playing with um, how they're playing with boundaries, and in both cases, you have to know what the boundaries are very tightly. In, in the case of science, much much more tightly. But in the case of art too, you you created an effect. You kind of want to know how you did that. Um, you don't have to go down to the micron, but it's uh, it's good to know. So there's a lot of similarity there in the spirit of the improv. And so then that brings me to the social part, and this is the part that's really crazy, because uh, the current administration is playing fast and free with facts. They are improv the shit out of the political uh, context, uh, yeah. international context. And th how is that different from art and science? They've taken the stuff that we teach in colleges about how, well, it's interpretation, and you can really alter the boundary conditions. All the stuff I just said, you can use that to create absolute bullshit. Um, so what is the difference between being rhetorical and improvisational with your facts uh, and your uh, method of creating facts and what, what seems to be happening now? I'll suggest one thing that I'm interested in hearing what you think the difference is. They're just doing it for maintaining power and money where it should be, territory. Um, if you don't do that, then you're in an other terror. You're doing other stuff. And I think that's where the sort of the sublime and transcendent nature of art and science goes to not just keeping more power and, and money, but to discovery. Other than that, it seems a lot alike. It seems well, like Well, yeah. I mean, it, this is, I think this is a huge area of, of concern and complication. You know, the legacy of um, prioritizing um, improvisation and prioritizing flexible thinking um, and the acceptance of contingency, all that stuff. Um, I, you know, I think w one in important or useful distinction is between cynicism and irony. You know, to know that you're being deceptive and to go ahead with it anyway is very different than, you know, being open to a range of interpretations um, of a data set, whether it's in the arts or or in the sciences. Um, also an aesthetic component. What they're doing is so ugly. I mean, it's ugly to people. It's, you know, I think both science and art are this truth and beauty thing, you know, that we're trying to look for something deeper. And well, they're, I mean, is, that, or is, it, is it a matter of motive? So is it a matter of what purpose is it's being used for? And is it... Is it art? Is it science? You know, the, the one, when I hear that the, the, there is a distinction, so epistemologically they're different systems, but when it becomes an identity, that you start saying, I am an artist, mm -hmm. that he is a scientist, what, what concerns me is then we, be, we become, uh, we stop being able to really see the other because we have so many assumptions about what it is to be an artist, what it is to be a scientist, that it limits our capacity to, to be, just to be. And um, so I, you know, I'm thinking, as we're having this conversation, I'm thinking, is this conversation a scientific conversation or an artistic <laughs> sci conversation? Is it either? Is it neither? Because if it's an artistic conversation, then anything is possible in the conversation. That's the way I feel about it. That's how it occurs to me. If it's a scientific conversation. What happens for me is that I think there must be, there are experts. There are experts, and I'm not one of them. I should leave it to the experts to talk about. And I think that's harmful. I think that gets in the way of a generative conversation. So for me, a con contextualizing this as an artistic conversation gives me freedom. To just to belong, to feel like whatever anybody is saying will add and build something. So I'm interested to know how you relate to this conversation for yourselves. As, is it artist? Is it scientist? Well, I, I think 
I think in, in relation to that, I think we need experts, but then there are experts that connect the dots. Uh, Gregory Bateson talks about the pattern that connects mm. and uh, finding similarities between these experts and connecting it in a way that, that's interesting. We've divided things for so long uh, and we found success with that, but there, there is value in, in connecting them, I think. It's interesting, I come, from a f I come from two fields. One is narrative therapy and the other is narrative <laughs> medicine. And both of them uh, essentially believe that the person who's consulting the doctor or the therapist is the expert. They're the expert in their own lives. And that does not mean that the practitioner hasn't got a particular scientific or uh, therapeutic expertise that is necessary, but it really is a shift in the power relationship. There's um, Brian Eno, who's known as a musician. He also has an interesting idea. He's also a great collaborator. Uh, he has this uh, notion that he calls senius. Uh, we, we live in a society that's obsessed with the individual achievements, the genius. The, mm. And uh, we, we almost have a cult of ego. And I think um, we need to move past that. And he talks about, you know, we may obsess over Picasso or something like that, but we, we don't really look at the, the scene that he came from. It's an ecology of ideas, a conversation about ideas that forms... Uh, the ground from which a person like that can, can emerge. And I, I think we've obsessed so much on the individuals that you know, we need to think about the, the entire ecology. I was thinking about that just today, too, that a lot of the examples of sci art um, successes are like these rock stars, and they're, they're great, and uh, they just like, it's just bam, you know? And then, then there's everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and so, with reference to society again, how many of these geniuses can we spread around? Uh, similar conversation in, in history of science too. We pick these heroes, and then there's all this other stuff going on. Legions of people doing, but we only, you know, we have a very small handful of names. Um, so, in, in reference to society, how can we? Basically, what we want to do, I think, it sounds like, is we want science to be more widespread, and we want art to be more widespread. Generally, that would be good regardless of how, although we don't want to turn art into a propaganda tool for science because science keeps changing. It'll make mm -hmm. monkeys out of artists and scientists to be really good at propagandizing today's science. That's happened so many times already. So instead, what do we do if we could harness the power of, of many ordinary individuals, which we are mostly, um, through a generative process? So this is the, the idea. Um, for a sci art project that doesn't involve too many geniuses, but involves lots of non geniuses, <laughs> would be something like <laughs> yeah, this could be a disaster. Uh, <laughs> chaos, <laughs> <though> is, <laughs> chaos is generative too. So it would be something like this you, you have some large scale, um, literally, I'm talking scale now, large scale in space and time. Um, thing that you want to, what do you call it? It's not an exhibit, it's not going to be in a museum, but event, or, but you want it to last. So maybe it's a mural that covers several square miles or something. And then the bits of it are going to be done by individual people. And, and there's things like this before. I'm just not, I don't know the examples of it, but it's through some kind of combinatorial analysis too that you can do this. It's not just you're going to make a grid and you guys are going to be responsible for these things, so hold up the blue plaque. It's more like, uh, the improv element comes in. It's more like, okay, uh, <clears throat> there's a problem. You all have to solve it. Here's your boundary. Uh, you solve your problem in here when I say go. And so they're all going to be solving. It's like parallel processing. That's what I'm trying to say. Instead of serial processing in a computer, a lot of people are solving the same problem at the same time in the same area. They don't know exactly what they're going to get when they hook up. But it's done by a bunch of small, slow processors. This is like when you hook up a bunch of um, uh, s little computers, 256 of them in a big array, you can do a lot of great things that a supercomputer didn't do. Or you take a bunch of really low-res um, lenses and you wire them together in an array like a dragonfly's eye, you get a very high-res comparable to. So this is getting a bunch of low-res people 
<laughs> non-geniuses to do <laughs> something that they understand in their locality, and then the product is something that's great, even though individually... And then it's yeah. sort of something well, that's happening. I mean, to go back to Paul's, this is a very good question, is this a, I'm going to be thinking about that for a while, is this a science conversation or an art conversation? I think one of the things that has fostered a better relationship between the arts and sciences is the trend in the arts toward collaborative and participatory work. I mean, that's something that's been on the rise for decades now. And I'm thinking in terms of, you know, this idea of, of lots of low-res people. Um, none of us are going to identify ourselves as those low lots of low-res people. Um, you know, there is work that sort of enacts that. I'm thinking of Tino Segal, although he's just one um, artist who's done that kind of participatory work where, you you know, he had a show at the, I'm sure some people here are familiar with his work. He, he had a show at the Guggenheim that was, in, it, it was about um, having um, his collaborators stage conversations with visitors to the museum. They were scripted. He walked into the museum. He did this also in galleries and other places around the world. And the conversations that took place were the art. Um, and they were scripted in the beginning, but then after that, it was, you know, it was a real time, real life conversation. Um, so that is, you know, a kind of art work that sits on um, this boundary, um, yeah. as do a lot of, um, you know, more sort of conventionally um, definable collaborations between artists and scientists. Yeah, scientist. I would sort of like to pick up on collaborations in the visual arts, and there are some. And there are more now coming, I agree with you. But artists, visual artists, are not great collaborators. <laughs> <laughs> They're not going to sit there and take instruction about you know, from geniuses or non-geniuses. <laughs> it just doesn't happen that way. But I, I do want to bring this back to society because I yeah. think that's the triangulation that we need to concentrate on rather than the dyadic structure art versus or art and science, etc. cetera. Uh, in 2004, I wrote this book called The Molecular Gaze, Art in the Genetic Age, published by Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press, which is an august scientific institution, and it's the first time they produced an art book. Uh, it's a collaboration with the late Dorothy Nelkin, who was a sociologist of science, and unfortunately she died before the book came out. But um, when we teamed up together, and I said to her, for every sociological aspect of science you can come up with, I will come up with a visual constituent image. So there is a certain kind of possibility here of not essentially uh, patronizing scientific companies or whatever, but really looking at the data bank in art history of how people were thinking about some of the things that are prevalent in society now, such as genetic engineering. Now, this is very similar to the concept of collage or cut and paste techniques. This goes back to 3000 BC. So it's, it's not a question that this is all new. It's not new. It has this kind of um, creeping buildup that includes innovation, includes accident, includes recognition. Um, last time I was here, and I was on a panel with you, uh, Galassi was here, and Barbara Stafford, and uh, several others, quite a high-res group, I must say. <laughs> and um, Galassi is the scientist who discovered mirror neurons uh, by accident, okay? So that is one of the things, I think, is part of discovery that may join these two forces, but it's about recognition of the accident and being able to extrapolate it. I mean, one of the reason I went into design originally was that I was interested in art and interested in science, and it seemed to me that design was the combination of the two, so therefore the perfect thing. 
but then you have designed sort of somewhat in subsur subservience to commerce, you know, mm -hmm. that you're, you're making a living, you're, you're doing propaganda in some ways, um, and that's why, you know, when sort of started thinking about the environment and we have to change our whole energy system, what's a new energy system going to look like? Or how is it, you know, how is it going to be better than the hodgepodge we have now? So I guess I think there are ways that art and science can impact the future, you know, whether it's having something to say about AI or uh, our energy systems or, yeah, where we're going. Yeah, I think actually um, looking forward in the future, I think design and architecture are really, uh, have high possibility of blurring the line between fine art and science. Uh, I was, we were on, in a um, symposium last month called Strange Attractors, and I spoke to some scientists there that felt that neuroscience or uh, neuroaesthetics is, there's nothing to it, um, that, uh, you know, it's a doesn't have uh, real science behind it yet, but um, with three decades plus of making art under my belt and the subjective experience of that, uh, I think, personally, I can say absolutely. My thinking and my creative problem-solving skills have been enhanced by uh, both the product that, that I have made and the process of making it. And um, when we think about the architecture that we have around us being dictated by profit margins and costs, uh, where if we could study further neural aesthetics and find the pattern, I think it was um, in the newest book by Max Tegmark, he says, you know, it's not matter that matters, it's the pattern, it's the structure uh, that's, that gives intelligence. And if we, we can uh, extrapolate from that structure uh, that we can surround ourselves in, in our civic design and, and architecture. Uh, you know, we could build a, a, a city, an urban design, uh, even interior design that could uh, potentially have a small part in making us better thinkers and problem solvers. Architecture and building has been often a joint venture all along. Yeah, if you want to go back to Plato with that, too. If I just design the ideal republic, then the citizens will naturally be good. Uh, that's, that's the idea, right? And uh, if we add science to that and get some really good artists, not push the poets out, but bring them back in to work with the scientists, then we can make this ideal republic that, that not only is designed well, but also produces. Uh, the only thing that and he was being kind of ironic and metaphorical and all that, and we should, we should take him as that when he pushed the poets out. But I think it points up one th really good thing um, that, um, that I think Plato uh, does express very well. Collaboration is not enough. If we get really good at science art collaboration, we could still do some really heinous things mm -hmm. that look beautiful. I mean, intelligence by itself is not enough. Uh, we can do some horrific things with um, better intelligence and make it palatable with art. So it leaves the moral component that many people brought up the other day about how, um, what are the social values? Um, can, where's social justice? How, do we, how does that work into this picture? And, um, there, we don't want, uh, of all places, to be elitist in the sense that, well, we'll design the design of the size of the room and door and window for you, but, and we'll also decide for you what are the best moral values for you and you, and you <laughs> because you're all so much alike and all that. So that can't be done. So how do we do it instead? It goes back to the ground um, layer of um, working, listening to each community and letting those values come from them. In other words, trusting, it's chaotic again, but trusting in the sub, low, res, whatever um, community, which already has pride of place, as the person who mentioned Appalachia the other day, yesterday. Um, people have pride in, of their, they know their place, they know their land, and uh, they know that community many generations. They're in the best position to express something beautiful about it artistically. Uh, as as well as uh, other values, as well as knowing what the problems there are. 
So applying just raw intelligence to what we think are the main problems of some part of uh, West Virginia, not the best way to go, but the participatory research stuff that you mentioned, that's, that's the way to go. And when you do that, you can add to that uh, participatory art as well as participatory science as well as participatory um, social value and social justice. So you're listening more and letting it come up and really all you're doing is creating the context. Uh, is this an art adventure? Is this a science adventure? Is this a government adventure? Well, no, we're just going to set up a context. Not sure what to call it, but then it'll be something the community can uh, define as it goes and redefine and redefine and redefine as it goes. And from that will emerge um, something better than a top-down design that's done by intelligent people, which fails utterly. Yeah, well, you now have do-it-yourself biolabs uh, internationally. Um, in New York, it's <coughs> Genspace and Biohackers Without Borders. Um, and this sort of um, theme is an expansion of what computer hacking was in the, in the 90s to now engage in hacking biology. And um, the general public is invited in to take very short courses in whether it's genetic engineering or um, cloning or painting with bacteria, et cetera. And this is a very interesting construct because if you look at the do-it-yourself um, bio community, uh, you will see it's almost in every country in the world. Um, I don't know what the repercussions are going to be with this. Alan Jorgensen, who's one of the founders of Genspace, and um, comes in as an invited scientist to, to my lab, um, is also friends with the FBI, okay? That's so many times the friends, FBI. Friends, really? Is that the right friends. word? <laughs> How do you do that? Friends. <laughs> Uh, well, they were very taken by her, and uh, she has never received any, um, you know, intrusive kinds of arrests. That she knows of. Uh, uh, she's a PhD in molecular biology. She's a member of TED, and um, and this is sort of her her forte is to bring science to the community, um, from children to adults to even scientists who do not have an institutional affiliation. Try doing science at home. I mean, you need a lot of equipment. So, um, so I think we need to fold that into this conversation mm -hmm. as the fact that science has spilled out of the laboratory into our everyday lives in many ways and to articulate some of those things, from the clothes we wear to the food we eat to the medicine we take, um, et cetera, et cetera, that this is a revolution in the transformation of materials, human materials, animal materials, the sale of materials, blah, blah, blah. Um, and this has been going on you know, since the late 80s. So I think. Those are some of the areas that people could be engaged with when they go to the supermarket and their food is not labeled as a GMO. And that's another thing we do in our lab is we do GMO testing. So we get to see what's what. And so, for example, when you're on Delta Airlines, don't eat the cookies. Okay? <laughs> Um, and, you know, <laughs> other things like that that are GMOs, whatever that means. I mean, that's a whole conversation mm -hmm. for the social order, that people are, um, are hidden. I mean, not people are hidden, but products are hidden in terms of what they consist of. Um, yeah. It's interesting. Uh, okay. No, it's interesting to me that you say people are hidden. People are hidden. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, they're hidden too. <laughs> some, of the, some of the more uh, rewarding work that I've done in the last several years has been working with people who are marginalised for some reason, and who are trying to a part of movements trying to change the narrative around them, around who they right. are. 
and they resort to pseudo-scientific language, trying to explain to people. For example, an example would be uh, people in Croatia with intellectual disabilities are often institutionalized from birth for a whole lot of psychosocial reasons. There aren't enough resources, so people are put in these draconian institutions and never see the light of day, are very poorly treated. So there is a movement to deinstitutionalize people and reintegrate them into the community. And so there was a whole body of knowledge trying to teach people that people with intellectual disabilities deserve to live in the world. They, they don't need to be locked away. But it's with opinion, what you get is opinion. So when you say, when you try and bring facts to people and say, these people don't belong in institutions, people say, but they do, and it becomes an <laughs> argument. So we were hired to come in and work with an organization of people with intellectual disabilities, training them to tell their personal stories, and they're not stories about living in institutions, they're ordinary stories about living in the world. And um, just why, so, so in order to be accepted into this organization, I needed to speak about my credentials. So I had been told before I went to Croatia that I should talk very, I should speak about my credentials as a doctor, as a psychiatrist, and I should definitely not mention my own personal story, which is, if you, go, if you Google me, you'd find out that most of my work has been around my own personal journey about being a gay man living with HIV, and that H my storytelling was a way of, before there was the science, of surviving, really, of finding a way of making sense of my experience as a person with HIV. I was told, do not mention this in Croatia, because no one will listen to you. So I arrived at the organization, and they said, welcome. We, we will not introduce you to the people you're going to work with yet. They're a vulnerable group till we feel safe with you. W who are you? And I said, well, <laughs> I'm a psychiatrist. And they went, don't even mention that word, because <laughs> in the institutions, the psychiatrists were the people that perpetrated terrible harm on the, on the people in the institutions. They said, can you tell us something personal about yourself? And I said, well, I like to hike. <laughs> and as the day progressed, it got more and more difficult until a certain point my performance partners, was an, it's another whole story of a 20-year collaboration with someone which is not easy, I can tell you, really collaborating. But he said to me, listen, if we don't speak the truth, we're not going to get to work with these people. So I told my story, and the social workers who were the interface with the organization ended up in tears and saying, well, that's why you're here. Come on in. And so what we did was teach people who really some didn't have language, some um, were ter beyond terrified to sit in front of a group. We eventually taught them to, to sing and to tell stories about very simple stories. One woman told the story of her niece, and she showed a picture of how much she loves that little girl, plays with her in the park. She's a woman with Down syndrome. And they then used these stories as part of a campaign that, that is, you can find as part of their organization. And it was the art. It was the art of storytelling. It was the one of the women couldn't speak at all, she just danced. But it was the art that communicated what the, I would say the science couldn't have. Mm -hmm. And uh, honoring those people as experts. So I think what you're saying is allowing it to come from the people, what it, what it is that's needed, is a particular kind of uh, consciousness that we can bring as artists and as scientists. Mm -hmm. I think that is a really good point to pause at and invite the audience up for questions. I'm going to emphasize again, um, people who come up for questions, uh, please ask questions for this panel because we're going to do an open group session where it's going to be more like pass around the mic, talk about you know your reflections for, for a minute or two and, and what you want to see next and that sort of thing. So more commentary things we can save for a little bit later, but let's get some questions going. 
Can I just say to your point that we throw out science and keep art? I mean, Newtonian physics works really well for most of the world, you know, <laughs> Darwinian yeah. evolution. Mm. You know, there are some things that yeah, we, we build on. Yeah. Right. But we, yes. I was, I was going to um, say something very similar. So yeah. Let me expand on that a little bit. On, on this notion that um, science is always discarding itself, whereas, you know, we keep um, Leonardo, but we don't keep old scientific ideas. Um, it's not, not quite true. It's true that science is, uh, in an important sense, self-correcting. Um, but it's not uh, disposable in the sense that whatever version of the truth we have at any one moment is path-dependent. And knowing that path is very important. It's, um, we, need to we need to understand um, Aristotle's cosmology and what was wrong with it and what we learned about the universe that made us realize that that was limited. And we, like you just said, we need to understand Newton's laws. In fact, we can't teach science without teaching Newton's laws. Um, and then we teach why they don't quite apply fully because of what we've learned since then. It would, but it wouldn't make sense to, to t teach science and to know science without knowing that history of, of ideas that are, uh, you know, when I say wrong, I mean in a cer certain sense, limited. And so maybe keeping Newton and keeping Aristotle is not that different from um, keeping um, Leonardo. I mean, you don't teach artists. I mean, artists have to learn about Leonardo, but you don't teach a professional artist now go out and make art exactly like Leonardo any more than we teach um, go out and do uh, Aristotle's cosmology. Um, and as I understand art, which is not fully, um, there are also movements and um, things that, you know, ways that are things are done and you don't go out and do art the way it was done 20 years ago. So there is that sort of revision, too. It's not quite the same sort of, sort of linearity. But maybe there's a little more commonality there than, um, than was represented. Um, the other quick point I wanted to make was about this notion of uh, uh, not having everything just done by geniuses. I thought that was a very interesting part of the conversation. And there is this question of who owns art and who owns science? Who's it for? Is art just for professional um, artists in art departments? Or is it for everybody? And we can ask the very parallel thing about science. And, and so this notion of having, having projects that everyone can do, and you were kind of crowdsourcing and all that, you were kind of feeling it. There's a really good model in science now for citizen science, where there are these projects where it's not just because it's cool as an outreach thing to involve people. In fact, the science is better. There are certain kinds of science where having lots of people out there recording and sensing and contributing makes, gives us an ability to do kinds of science that we couldn't do when it's just the genius. And so the idea, and, and you mentioned a project at a museum that maybe kind of hinted at this too, but the, the idea of sort of citizen sci art, where we use some of these same platforms to uh, really be collaborative in some way that it's not about the uh, genius uh, vision of the, the great ego, but um, the uh, contribution of the masses. And maybe, uh, maybe there's a way that the, uh, the citizen science model can be uh, further applied to, uh, to sci art. And, and uh, also, I mean, in, in that line, there's the maker movement, which is something that's going on where, you, and, and you mentioned these bio labs, which is kind of like that, where, where you really are bringing in lots of people. And it's not just about the lone genius vision, but like getting people involved. So I think, I think that's a very um, useful direction we can think of in this conversation. Well, as far as Leonardo, uh, um, I'm reading the new biography uh, by Isaacson. And it's uh, maybe, you know, the thought that I had was not that we should paint like him, but we should think like him. He was an integrator and, and, and brought disparate things together. And I think that's where his real uh, inspiration is. I ask a following question. I was asked yesterday by this gentleman to display some of my artwork out there. Um, I noticed. Um, I noticed the ongoing uh, difficulty uh, we are having with uh, correlating art and science, etc., etc. Um, I was fortunate enough to, uh, when I splashed paint and 
mix paint with other paint, etc., etc., to discover the formation process of the vertebrae, etc., etc. Details are out there, and I would like you to give me some feedback as to if you can uh, agree to that. I mean, I think I discovered the formation process of the vertebrae and other important, like, Horseshoe crab splashes, exactly. They established uh, the fact that uh, the physics of liquid formation correlates to biological formation processes. And um, yeah, give me some feedback if you would, please. I'll be here. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to say one, you, you had a lot there. Uh, I didn't want to gloss over the value of art, which you know, probably have a whole conference on, on that question alone. But I, I, I think. Um, Something I've been thinking about a lot is that we emphasize the product that is art, the noun of art, but I think there, uh, we should emphasize and put as much value, perhaps in education, uh, um, on the verb of art, the process of art, the thinking that is art. Um, but again, that's a, that's a loaded conversation. <laughs> so, thank you all for your wonderful thoughts today and on other days. I had, uh, I guess, two, two questions related to authorship, which I think came up a lot in the discussion and was part of the first question. Um, one is kind of the model of authorship in sciences versus arts. Um, I think in science publications, there's a long history of many authors being on mm -hmm. the publication, uh, and less so with humanities and artists, although we have fields within the arts that know how to credit many people, you know, theatrical performances, the film industry, animations. There are hundreds of people listed um, as producers in a larger work. And I'm wondering whether these kind of considerations of authorship might also affect how we think about science art production and collaboration and whether changing our models for authorship, when we have a participatory piece, we're actually crediting the, the low res people in that piece and not just saying, oh, this is a Nick Cave sound piece that happened to be sewn by 100 people found on Craigslist or whatever. Um, so one is this question of authorship. <coughs> I'm curious about your, your thoughts about changing models of authorship within the fields of art science and art science and sci art, whatever. Um, the other is a, a question about, uh, in particular, participatory art. And you kind of put forward this model of the grand mural with small components fabricated or designed by other people, and we have this idea of seeingness, which, as opposed to genius, which I thought was very interesting. Um, and I think there's another interesting strand that I would be curious for the group to comment on, which is um, sort of trends in evolutionary art, uh, where the participant is part of the aesthetic, uh, where I think one of the kind of standard examples, we have electric sheep, where people are voting on the aesthetic direction of a digital artwork, and there's genetic algorithms involved in its production. Uh, another interesting example is Komar and Melman, who kind of uh, say, you know, this has some problems to it. Uh, when we ask everybody to participate and vote, you get something that's pretty Arbol. dreadful. And <laughs> you get the best painting of every country that is a landscape, and it has George Washington in the corner, and kind of like a deer on the side and everybody is happy, but the end result is something that is, is not all that satisfactory. Um, and so how do you, I guess, the second question is in this question of authorship uh, intersecting with the people or the public or the low res people, whatever you want to call it, how do you also preserve this aspect of novelty search that is so important in art making and finding outliers, you know? artistic visions that do not come about through a democratic process? That is such an important question. I mean, two questions, three questions, many questions. And um, I'm glad you brought Komar and Melman into the discussion. Mm -hmm. I'm sure um, most people in this room know about this series of town hall meetings they had where they would ask for, you know, the attendees to um, vote on elements that should be in the best picture. And you know, they varied according to region, of course. But there's always a lot of blue, because blue is everyone's favorite <laughs> color. And some people like abstractions, and some people like 
landscape, so there's all, so, you know, on the one hand, you know, I think it's really important that people who are involved in the creation of artwork be credited. Um, this has resulted in a lot of wives um, being acknowledged as co-authors of work that used to be attributed only to their husbds. You know, we're looking at Keenholz and and um, Christo and um, Klaus Holdenberg, and I'm missing a lot of people. But so these are, you know, these are good things happening. There are artists who acknowledge. Um, their assistants um, very explicitly, um, and there are artists who, who don't. Um, on the other hand, and I think this is um, really important, and I'm not going to be proposing a hard and fast rule here, um, there is tremendous danger in, I think, um, seeding the, um, the initiative for producing the work to the public, and I think it's suspect because it's a you know it's a way that um, institutions have boosted their audience. You know this sort of drive toward everyone's a winner, everyone's an artist, everyone's a participant. <laughs> your you know your expertise is as valuable as mine, and it's particularly prevalent in the arts because really everyone does feel in their hearts of heart hearts that they're artists. Why not? What do you need to be an artist? Not much, just an opinion, right? <laughs> so, um, I, you know, I think being clear about negotiating those two, you know, kind of irresolvable um, perspectives mm -hmm. is really important. I'm, I'm not sure who, who it was. Uh, might have been Thomas Jefferson that said, democracy only works with an educated public. Um, and the same is true with art. Um, the status of art education in this country. We can't expect people to know how. I mean, there are cer certain basic uh, um, teaching that needs to happen. Um, and as far as authorship, I think if there's uh, a, a matter of prior prioritization, if we have a priority more on the product and what what the product, and the product is a thing, and the product is the thinking, what it is doing for us, mm -hmm. uh, there'll be less of uh, a need to want to have authorship, uh, even though it, I, I think it's important, but I think the focus should be on what it is and what it's doing. Yeah, and I have two comments. One, assistance on the wall under his name. But let's take this expression, everyone's an art critic, uh, I don't know much about art, but I know what I like. What if I go into a scientific laboratory <laughs> and I say, I don't know much about science, but I know what I like. <laughs> well, that's, and that's, that's what's happening. Yeah, that's, that's a good thing. That is what's happening right now. I know what facts I like. <laughs> Could I use that as a segue for my question? Yes. Um, so I wanted to, to ask a question uh, based on Farzad's uh, parallel processing question. and, and um, Whenever I come to some of these conferences as a guest or whichever on this side or this side, I always, always wonder um, how can we harness the power of the people in the room? And so you're talking about science, art and science and society. This is a micro society. Mm -hmm. And we often, um, and these are great conversations to listen to and be part of. Um, but I'm, I wonder how can we also use our experimental processes that we're going through finding out how to collaborate and how to collaborate in these new ways that are not genius centered, that are, that are about um, looking at other people and listening to them and ha taking time uh, and doing things in parallel and then coming back together. And so I'm curious, just in terms of having you as a smaller group, uh, iterate about the next panel in terms of like where, or not panel, the collective discussion is where do we go as a, as a community? Are we a community? And do we have processes that we can start to put into place so that we always make sure that even if we don't harness the power of the room today, we leave the room knowing that the power of the room is going to be, <coughs> that there are processes in place, whether they be online, offline, uh, about meeting at the next cafe next week or whatever. I'm just curious to have you play with that? So. I think that's a great suggestion for the final panel, uh, to, for the structure of the final panel, to do that. And uh, can you figure that out between now and then? Well, <laughs> it reminds me of um, 
in family therapy, there used to be a, well, there still is in some contexts, a one-way mirror in which the expert sat on the one side and watched the family working with the therapist. There was a phone and the experts would call in and the therapist would pick up the phone with the family sitting there and go, okay. <laughs> and say they want to know why you're so angry or whatever it is. And so it sets up the unknown invisible experts. There was a, I think his name was Carl Tom in 1987, decided to do away with the one-way mirror and he took down the mirror so that now the people could see the experts. And it changed everything, because <laughs> behind those one-way mirrors, people would say things to each other about the family that the family would never hear. Suddenly, anything that got said was heard, and that became known as a reflecting team. And what it did was it broke down the, the power relationship. So I think the question's really important. I think that what can happen here is even when you're having questions at directed at us, we become somehow, we are the experts in the room and everybody else is, a, is an outsider witness group, really. If we now turned, if we all shut up and listened to reflections from the room that don't necessarily have anything to do with directly with what we've spoken, we would get a whole other body of knowledge that would arise. And then it would end with us reflecting on what we'd heard. And that's a standard practice in narrative therapy, using communities and then outsider witness groups and then reflection. I think that's a wonderful way to go. Well, clearly I should have just asked you to introduce the last, you know, <laughs> collective session because that is exactly the idea. Um, there's not going to, when we, when we meet again in 20 minutes or, or whatever, there aren't going to be people sitting in the middle. It's just going to be kind of, you know, as we are and the thoughts that we can squeeze in, you know, in the time that we have, which will continue. And, and there are a lot of ideas floating around, which we'll discuss a little bit later about how to continue this um, online, offline, in person, over there, over here, sort of. Uh, take yours. Okay, so I want to give a, a little contribution to this therapy session. Because, <laughs> uh, I actually, I'm a uh, long-term collaborator with Tala Volk. I'm a scientist. I'm retired, but I'm still active, and I always crash at his apartment and uh, makes it very convenient. So he invited me here. I came Friday night. My name's David Schwartzman, by the way. And uh, I want to start with a quotation, which may, I don't know if it's been used yet, because I wasn't here yesterday. Art is not a mirror of reality, but a hammer with which to shape it. And that's attributed to Bertolt Brecht, but there's some controversy whether it's Mayakovsky or whatever. But what it brings up is art as a technology, and I think that the technology part has been alluded to, but it's the intersection of art, technology, and science, I think, is really critical. So yes, art is a mode, uh, there's a mode of production, technology to make art, but art itself is a technology like uh, Amelia's uh, design, solar design, and obviously architecture and so on. So it's a technology, but it's also uh, uh, and let me make an, a quick point about the conflation of science and technology. Uh, if you're critical of GMO, then you're anti-science. You've heard that. If you're critical of a technology which appropriates molecular biology, then you are immediately, uh, by s those in that, uh, let's say, business, your attack is being anti-science. Um, and I would, I was very influenced by Louis Althus's uh, philosophy, uh, works. In particular, art as a mode of aesthetic production, which I think some of his followers all, already also wrote about. And, uh, and not only brings in the mode of production of making art, but how art interfaces with social movements. Uh, the swastika, 
is an obvious example of a fascist aesthetic which had a powerful, I think it had a real powerful influence in empowering the fascist movement. That symbol, which of course was appropriated from India or the Navajos or whatever. But I would uh, share with you too uh, a, a more positive example. Uh, as a scientist, I went to the science march. And uh, of course, I, uh, I'm a climate justice activist and all the rest. But there was signs saying, science has brought us the cell phone and a cures for, I don't know, penicillin or whatever. No one held up a sign saying science brought us nuclear weapons. So the, uh, uh, what I pose, I guess there's a question here. <laughs> what I'm posing is uh, the um, great potential of art being uh, uh, a part of progressive social movements to change the world, going back to Brecht's quotation. Mm. I'll uh, sort of make a comment to that. Um, well, art is a way to engage in the cultural imaginary. And if we go back to Aristotle, he talks about the poetic epistome, which is the role of images, objects, words, etc., cetera, um, to essentially get towards that, that it's the idea that is expressed through this materialization. And, you know, the influence of art as an icon within social practice is a thesis in itself. We can take it on both sides. Um, you know, another, another image that the Nabom young girl running naked with burnt body from Vietnam, or the Abu Ghraib images, or Michael Jackson. Uh, these are icons that then carry with them huge social dimensions. And that's, in many ways, what an icon does. Whether we go back to um, Russian Orthodox religion, et cetera, that it encapsulates all of the social surround, and it has not changed. Yeah, and art also can be a, a simulation for um, the full spectrum of the human experience. Science is mostly objective, uh, but there's this huge subjective part of us, uh, emotions, and, and uh, art can be a stage in which we can put these things together and run a simulation. I think that's a, another valuable way to think of it. My name is Cynthia Panucci, and um, so I founded Art and Science Collaborations here in New York 30 years ago. Um, and, and I've watched the field slowly develop over these years. Um, uh, you know, after being an art student and coming to New York to start my art career in the early 70s, I worked in the top print gallery in New York, um, the AAA gallery. doesn't exist anymore, but, um, you know, I saw the elitism of the art world. And, and then I see my family members, who mostly, they're not artists, but, and people that I know, galleries are incredibly uh, off-putting to the common person, the common man. So science, <laughs> yesterday I said we have to sort of sneak in science and, and surprise people with it because you mentioned the word and people turn off, their eyes glaze over. So I think that the, the people in this room, we represent a really privileged, rarefied environment. And I just went to Thanksgiving with my family and relatives, and you know, I cannot talk about my work because there's no talking about, they feel they're not experts. And they feel because I've been in this field for X amount of years, maybe I'm somewhat of an expert anyway. Um, I like the ideas of crowdsourcing information in citizen science because it's sort of a natural way to bring people in to the issues that we're all really concerned with, I think, in this world. We, we want to make the world a better place to live, one that's environmentally sustainable. 
for future generations. And we want, we have the privilege of thinking about the implications of AI or genetic engineering. Most of the people in my family and the people on this, <laughs> the common man, you know, they come home. This is how my brother explained it years ago. We come home. We have three children. We do dinner, dishes. We make their sandwiches. We do, um, you know, their homework with them. We read stories to them. We're exhausted. We go to bed. We, we have hybrid minds. I think we have a responsibility to our society to put our energies together and to work on some of the very, what do they call the complex problems of our time, the, the stubborn issues, what, what is that term? <laughs> the wicked <laughs> problems. Um, anyway, um, it, it's sort of for the next room's panel, but it sort of addresses the crowdsourcing information, the elitism. the, the Thinking that the, the local person, like in Appalachia or wherever, or my brother lives in Michigan and there are invasive species going into Lake Michigan, and that's why the water is crystal clear. You can drink it practically. It's beautiful. It cannot sustain life. And the fishing, where tourists like to come and fish, it's seeded by the forestry de biology department at University of Michigan, they put the fish in there every year. I mean, what type of environment do we want to live in? A totally artificial environment? But we are the kind of hybrid minds that can be the visionaries, the leaders. And I'm not meaning to be elitist. I think we have to listen to the problems, but the people in Michigan or Wisconsin, the whole border, Chicago area, they're not thinking about this in the future and what it's going to mean for the tourist industry and for just enjoying the lake. Anyway. I, I think that is a great place to end and is kind of um, giving us the impetus to not let this uh, fizz out as uh, things so often do after conferences. Okay, so we're going to have our last artistic interlude of the weekend. We're going to hear from Dr. Shirley uh, Mueller, who is a neuroscientist, but uh, we're going to hear how neuroscience can interact with museum exhibition, uh, which is a kind of new trend I see happening around, especially at places like Peabody Essex Museum in Massachusetts. So we're going to watch a short video. We'll take a break, reconvene for the wrap-up. Okay, we so got through fun, it. It's a fun chair <laughs> dance turn around. And thank you, panelists, for, for a wonderful panel this morning. I was still mic'd. <laughs> <laughs> if we could get the lights turned down a little bit on this side, perfect. Yeah,